Well, we are live right now and we are just going to wait for a few minutes that people start to, to join us and just be with us. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. We are just giving some minutes for more people to join us. Uh, people is signing in right now. And we are just going to give another 30 seconds and we are going to start this conversation. Well, excellent. Uh, good morning, good morning, everybody. My name is Miguel Cortines. I'm the president of the Canadian Council for the Americas Alberta. And we are here this morning. Uh, today is June 22nd, 2021. And we are hosting these almost weekly chats uh, just to have different conversation about what is happening in Latin America in diverse topics, right, from energy, and technology and different, different topics that are related to Latin America, just to keep the conversations. And, and this morning I'm here with uh, uh, my colleague and, and friend and part of the board of directors of the CCA, uh, Roger Machado. Good morning, Roger. Good morning. Excellent, excellent. And we today we are having a conversation, an interesting conversation that Roger proposed to, to us about biofuels in Brazil. And we have our special guest, uh, Luis Augusto Horta Nogueira. How are you, Luis Augusto? Yes, yes. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to having you here. Oh, ple my pleasure. My pleasure to That's share excellent. with you. That's Excellent. Well, uh, Roger is going to take the lead in this conversation, and I think we are very eager to learn what is what is happening with the biofuels industry. It's a very, very interesting topic. All the advantages, all the pros, all the cons. What is happening in Brazil in in, in this particular sector? And Roger, uh, please. Okay. Take thank the you. Screen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to read. Uh, um, Professor Orta's uh, bio, bio, biography here. So Professor Orta is a mechanical engineer. He is a PhD in mechanical engineer by Universidade de Campinas in 1987. He was, the, he was a professor of thermodynamics at the Universidade Federal de Itajubá 
from 1979 to 2016. And he, he was a visiting scientist at the United Nations at the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, from 1997 to 1998. He also led as a director of the Brazilian National Agency uh, for Petroleum, Natural Gas, and, and Biofuels from 1998 to 2004. And also he served as chair of the board for the Latin American Memorial in Sao Paulo in 2006. Uh, Professor Arthur also uh, served as a consulting energy studies for several United Nations agencies, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, the United Nations Environment Program. He also was a consultant in energy studies for the Inter-American Development Bank and the International Renewable uh, Energy Agency, uh, ARENA. Uh, he's now associate uh, researcher at the Interdisciplinary Group of uh, Energy Planning at the Universidade uh, Estadual de Campinas and the Excellent, Cent Excellent Center on Energy Efficiency of Universidade Federal de Itajubá. Uh, Professor Horta is an uh, owner. Uh, I need to say this, right? A bit of a personal um, uh, quote there. During the time I was a student at our university, right? You, you were the director of, uh, of A&P, right? The Petroleum Agency, Gas and Biofuel. So I didn't have the privilege to be one of your students or, or a, at any, any course, right? But there was this special lecture that you that you gave to to us right on a it was a Friday night right you only you would be able to have a bunch of twenty year old uh, students right staying at, until late at the university but it was really memorable and remarkable right you spoke about energy it was really I still remember right? it's been twenty years and uh, you know I'm grateful to all my professors. But I need to tell you this, Professor Art, uh, some professors really make an impact in, in their students, right? And, and you're certainly one of those. So it's an honor. Thank you very much for, for taking time to talk to us here today. And now without any further ado, right? Uh, 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 the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Art. Oh. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Roger, for such a kind introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, as you know, uh, I know that some teachers are important in our life, but uh, students also are very important for pushing us, for stimulating us. Thank you so much. It is for me a pleasure and an honor to be with you this, I don't know, this morning, this end of this morning in Canada, this beginning of the afternoon in, in Brazil. Uh, and discuss, comment with you, uh, some aspect of energy. Energy is an essential aspect in our lives, in our economy, but energy is uh, passing a kind of transition, as you know. Um, today is very common to mention, we are moving from different schemes of using and uh, producing energy. I will uh, discuss in today with you some aspect of the Brazilian experience on bioenergy, okay? Let me try to, to share. Okay, uh, I, I will uh, have your help in this, thank you. Uh, so uh, the next slide, please. I have two slides, um, two slides of the, for, for someone that uh, doesn't know <laughs> where is Itajubá in, in our country, Brazil as Canada is a large country, but we are in the middle of the three br big Brazilian cities, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte in a chain of mountains, a beautiful place and is the gate of our universe. Next slide, please. And uh, we have there basically courses on technological uh, fields. So we have nine different courses on engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering. And you have also some graduated courses. And uh, we are not a big, big universe in terms of dimension, but we are trying to do our best in terms of studies 
uh, in many cases for choosing uh, energy. Next slide, please. I have here the, my plan, my flight plan to, to present you some aspects of bioenergy and the Brazilian experience on ethanol from sugarcane is very important for us. Just to give you a number, we are producing nowadays uh, about uh, 600,000 uh, barrels of uh, equivalent oil in, in biofuels in Brazil. It's a lot of energy, it's very important for us. Uh, put some attention on the Renova Bio program. It's a program uh, to, uh, to, to put some value on the uh, uh, effect of bioenergy in terms of reducing uh, carbon emissions and then close with some prospects and challenges about these topics. Please, the next slides. So, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about energy now, and, and the discovery of the way to produce fire is, was, uh, it, 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 it was a very important uh, change in our lives. And since then, we start to use biomass. Our first source, ex exogenous source of energy is uh, was certainly firewood. And nowadays, uh, driven by economic, environmental, energy security reasons, the interest in bioenergy uh, came back with a very, very uh, strong interest. Next slide, please. So uh, every uh, biofuel came from some photosynthesis occurred some time ago, some a month ago, producing some kind of biomass, which is converted in liquid biofuel as ethanol or biodiesel, as you know. Uh, in green, you have the countries that has uh, that, that, that have introduced some some mandate, blending mandate. Brazil, for instance, uh, I will show you is using all gasoline in Brazil has a 27% ethanol, but I know that in Canada and the United States also uh, is, is used. In currently in United States, the uh, blend, all gasoline in the United States is E10 as minimum. Uh, so at minimum, uh, the, uh, a minimum content of 10% ethanol in gasoline. But it, it is, could be used also in other countries that are producing, that are in conditions to use the domestic fuel, and it is the way that we are reducing uh, a carbon emission, promoting some uh, rural development and other kind of benefits. Uh, recently, India decided to push the uh, current level of blending, about 10%, to 50 and 20%. Uh, it's an important country, and the same is occurring in some provinces in, in China. But uh, in fact, today, there is a clear trend to introduce biofuels abroad. The next slide, please. So uh, it is recognized by international uh, agencies as International Energy Agency. Uh, we know that we are using other uh, renewable sources of energy. The electrical vehicles is considered uh, an important uh, change towards a more uh, friendly uh, energy processes. But in fact, the bioenergy represents nowadays a most important source of alternative energy uh, in regards to uh, oil and, and fossil fuels. Uh, it is uh, the report from AIA uh, observing that modern and bioenergy leads the growth of our renewables. The next slide, please. But uh, to start this, I, I, I have heard many times about the problem of bioenergy. The main problem of bi bioenergy is the competition, the impact of bioenergy in the, of the supply of food. They have a collection of cartoons about that. So uh, I, I think that deserves some attention, uh, this issue. And the question is, is there really a food versus fuel dilemma? So uh, next slide, please. 
uh, I can summarize my perception and it, it's based on clear data and data matters, of, in fact. There is no lack of food. There are people not able to assess food. The production of food after, after the second war in the eight decades have been increased the per capita supply of food. There is no, no, no lack of food, that is the point. So there's no shortage of food, there is lack of access. And the real uh, problem for us is the global obesity pandemic before the COVID pandemic. Uh, it is a clear a problem that the people uh, need uh, uh, more uh, to be healthy. The, the offer, the, the over surplus of food is a, a, a serious problem. No, the next slide, please. And here you can see uh, the international prices uh, of FAO. FAO, as you know, is the United Nations agency that uh, are uh, focused on food production. And here you can see in the red curve in the couple of years, how the price, the average global price of food is reducing while the uh, production of fuel ethanol is, is, is increasing. So uh, uh, it's not, in fact, uh, a clear relationship of these uh, two aspects. In fact, we can produce a lot of food, more food than we are even able to eat. And we can also produce a lot of and, uh, uh, other products. In fact, agriculture is a source of fiber for different applications, a lot flowers <laughs> and other products. There is no lack of land and resources. It, it should be uh, uh, put in very clear terms. The next slide, please. Here uh, is a way that uh, we can explain why I'm not so uh, worried or concerned about that. The improvement of productivity and yields is very important source of production. There is no need of more land. It's a kind of Malthusian from Thomas Malthus, a uh, uh, wrong approach on this. Here you can see in the green line, the area dedicated to the uh, cattle pasture in Brazil. It's about the same. Brazil is a country with uh, uh, 840,000 uh, million hectares. We have half of this in the Amazonian forest and half of this is for economic reasons, is occupied for different places and different conditions. In, in this other area that is using farming, we are using uh, 200 million hectares is this green line, this 200 million hectares just for pastures, very uh, low productivity pasture effect. And we are increasing since in the last 1990, you can see in the red line, the increase of production of meat, of beef, of animal protein, and in the case of cattle in this area. So you can see that you increase the, the, our production three times in the same area. And the same occurred in other uh, kind of products, okay? And the next slide, please. So other way to show uh, this for you is taking a, a global uh, vision. So uh, in our planet, in our, in our nice planet, the earth, we have approximately 30 billion hectares for different cultures. It, it, it represents about 90% of the world land area. So about 90% of the area could be preserved or are in deserts or are in different areas. Just considering the area are arable that could be cultivated. The land available for rain feed crops that does not need irrigation is approximately 2.9 billion hectares. The area need to supply 11% of the global energy transport in 2030 is 45 million hectares. 
it represents in Brazil 5% of the Brazilian area. So uh, take this in account when considering the risk of bioenergy production in regards to the food production on another production. There is, in fact, no relation between these aspects, food and bioenergy. And please, the next slide. And here is the vision of the FAO. The FAO is the, as I mentioned, the United Nations organization dedicated to agriculture and food. And they said that you have to move from the food versus fuel debate to a debate on full food and fuel, certainly. And there are interesting benefits in terms of global emissions, in terms of employment generation, income generation, uh, promoting the sustainable development in many parts of the world where there is land and good climate to produce fuel. Please, the next project. So now, uh, if you agree with me that there is no uh, a serious problem, a, a worrying problem of using land to produce fuel, and it is true, let to put some attention on sugarcane. Sugarcane is a wonderful crop. It was, it is one of the most efficient crop in converting energy uh, from the sun in chemical energy. There is, it's among the, the top uh, efficient uh, plants. And uh, you, you can ask me, but what, what is the, the number, the, the efficiency? The efficiency, the photosynthetic efficiency, uh, that is uh, the kind of efficiency that you think they consider here, is about 1.5 to 2 percent. Oh, it's too low. No, it's not too low. Compare, compare it with a photovoltaic cell, it seems too low, but uh, the efficiency of converting solar energy in electricity in a solar cell is 15 to 18 percent. But in the moment there, when there is sun, during the night, the efficiency of the solar cell is, is zero. This efficiency of photosynthesis in the sugar cane, 1.5, 2%, is the efficiency during a whole year. So put the, the, the plant and they grow the plant and fix the solar energy and chemical energy. And besides, the sugar cane is a, a semi perennial crop. A very important difference regards maize, regards corn. You don't need to till the land every year and plant every year. You plant the sugar cane and harvest six years, the, the following years, he, grow, he grows. And one ton of sugar cane is equivalent to 1.2 bar of petroleum. So one hectare of sugar cane produce about 100 barrels of oil per year, uh, forever, because we're talking about the renewable energy, no? So sugarcane is very interesting to produce power. And sugarcane has sugar in his uh, stems. So you can convert easily this sugar in a liquid fuel, very uh, able to, to be used as fuel in some uh, kind of motors, other engines. The next, please, sorry. So here you can see uh, in this photo, a typical uh, Brazilian meal. These tanks are tanks for ethanol. You have the, uh, the sugarcane plantation around, and ethanol and sugar are produced uh, jointly in this kind of uh, plants. And the uh, byproduct, this, the fibrous byproduct called bagasse, is used in cogeneration to produce electricity, able to uh, supply, provide all energy required by the plant and supply also energy to the public grid. So uh, in average, in average of more than 400 mils for each unit of fossil energy that they are using directly or in the tractors, they are, they are using diesel or, or are using other fuels or, 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 or indirectly in the case of some uh, agrochemicals that are producing petrochemical industry. For each unit of fossil energy, you can produce eight to 10 units of renewable energy. 
in some cases more, depending on the, the survey. So uh, you are using a lot of people, even the case of mechanization, it's, it's a typical activity, a rural activity, agro-industry. So uh, it is the sugar cane agro-industry that is a source of sugar and power and liquid fuel. Next slide, please. And this industry in the last uh, decades have been incorporating, using a lot of knowledge, scientific knowledge to reduce energy consumption and reduce environmental impacts. The use of some residues as VNAS, the use of biological control of pests and disease. It is very common, the Brazilian sugar mills, not to use uh, pesticides. They are using, in many cases, biological control to uh, reduce the problem of this kind of, this border, for instance. The use of uh, bagues, bagues to produce power is very important. To, to, give, to give you an idea, uh, Brazil has a very big dam to produce a power, uh, hydropower, is a Taipu in the border of Brazil and Paraguay. Uh, this is a 40, uh, 14 uh, gigawatts plant. This capacity, 40 gigawatts, is the capacity already installed in operating in sugar mills in Brazil using the gas. And in this uh, picture with the red line is the reduction of water consumption in the industrial operation. Nowadays, we are using about one cubic meter per ton of sugar cane. Uh, while years ago, you use it 10 times more. So uh, science and technology played, is still playing and will play an important role in proving this uh, industry. Next one, please. Uh, here you have uh, the evolution of productivity and yields. Uh, I will leave this, this uh, presentation for you, so I will go faster. I, I do not have to extend, extend my time. The next, please. So you have here the new opportunity, the new frontiers of development of uh, technology using energy cane, very high productivity, and using cellulosic residues to produce ethanol and biogas production and so on. Next, please. And here you have the Brazilian energy matrix. It's interesting that uh, this, uh, this data is a uh, few years ago, so the pandemic effect is not considered here. And you can see Brazil uh, as one of the top uh, countries in regards to use of renewable energy. And renewable energy represents 43% of our energy matrix. It's, it's interesting uh, to, to push this uh, energy renewable, considering the impacts in terms of emissions and other, other aspects. In this context of the renewable energy, modern bioenergy and also the traditional bioenergy plays a very important role, represents a most of these uh, renewable energy came from bioenergy. The next one, please. And here you can see the, the history of ethanol introduction in Brazil in blends of gasoline. It is started in 1931 by law. All Brazilian gasoline has some blend of ethanol. This increased after the oil shocks in the 70s. And nowadays, the Brazilian gasoline has 27% uh, ethanol. There is no gasoline without 27% gasoline in the Brazilian gas stations. This started, as you can see in the Ford Model T, uh, in fact, more than eight years ago. And now you have also the pure ethanol cars and biodiesel blended uh, at the level of E13 uh, uh, that in all Brazilian uh, gas stations. Next slide, please. Here you have different, uh, more detailed, uh, data about the gasoline and ethanol consumption. As you can see in the dotted line, the gasoline represents 45% of the Brazilian current consumption in the, the 
uh, light cars, light vehicles. And in diesel, uh, we are using uh, nowadays around 90%, considering all the uses. Uh, you should consider that in Brazil, it's not uh, allowed to have small cars diesel. Diesel in Brazil is, uh, has a, a tax, a lower tax, because it's used for public transportation, for lower, uh, trucks and, and tractors. Next slide, please. Uh, here you have, as, you, as I said, the, the set of fuels that are distributed in our uh, gas stations. All gasoline, as I said, is E27. All diesel is B13. Next one, please. And you have the dimension of the Brazilian fleet. So uh, please, uh, Roger, uh, yes, one time more, yes. Just to show you that gasoline and ethanol, gasoline E27 and pure ethanol are used in our uh, 38 million cars, 13 mod bikes, and some of the light uh, dirty vehicles, the vans, and in the, in the red uh, box, we have the vehicles that are using diesel and biodiesel. We have uh, 2 million trucks and 40,000, uh, 400,000 uh, buses. Next one, please. Uh, it's, it's interesting to comment you, uh, the Renova Bill program, which was launched a couple of years ago to promote the reduction of GAG, greenhouse gas emission, the decarb decarbonize the Brazilian transport, and at the same time, foster the in development of industry with impacts on job generation and so on. The next, please, it's a box where I put, I present the three pillars of the uh, Renova Bill. The sets of decarbonization, decarbonization uh, was uh, defined by the government considering 10 years period and uh, it's presented to the fossil fuel distributors that are mandated to compensate these. This compensation uses some uh, certificates of CO2 emission uh, called CBIO. It, it was evaluated by a uh, qualifying agencies at level of each producers. So uh, using the concept of life cycle emission. The next one, please. So just take attention in the uh, calculus we have uh, here in the middle of this slide. We have the gasoline em emitting 86 uh, grams of CO2 per megajoule, okay? And uh, it's a typical value of hydrozethanol is 20 uh, grams of CO2 per megajoule of energy. It's a typical value. If you are using a more efficient process, we can emit even less, okay? So an average uh, efficiency in terms of emission is 65 grams of CO2 uh, per equivalent, per uh, megajoule of energy. So, uh, as you can see, 80, 833 liters of ethanol can reduce the emission, can mitigate one ton of CO2, which was calculated with very clear and consistent methodology. And is applied by international uh, accredited agencies that are verifying this. It is the scheme of uh, the people obliged to buy this CBIO, the people that are able to produce CBIO, it's a kind of carbon trade mechanism. Go on, please. My, uh, the next slide, please. So uh, we use this Renova Calc, which is the, with the, the spreadsheet we use it to calculate the certified this well to wheel. This procedure is well accepted Nowadays, we have more than 200 and, uh, 240 different uh, mills, uh, ethanol producers, and biodiesel producers, biomethane producers uh, allowed, certified to uh, issue these CBIOs. These CBIOs is traded in the uh, 
the, the, the market. Okay, the next one, please. So to give you uh, the, the results, the output of this is that uh, in this year, uh, the, all the oil distribution companies are committed to buy uh, 24 million tons of CO2, okay? That will be increased year by year until reach 90 million tons in 2030. So far, we have, uh, due to the COVID uh, shrinking in the market of fuel, fuel product, oil products, last year we traded just 45 million tons of CO2 for where in it and it was by. And the stock market, but the price of this is not under the government intervention. It's an open market of carbon uh, emission. And the price are in the, between six to $12 per ton of, of CBIO, of tons of CO2 not emitted. Please, the next one. So, uh, I have here some impact of this. Uh, it was last year, uh, 288 million dollars, US dollars, uh, it was uh, injected in the biofuels industry. It's a lot of money. And we, if we consider all the horizon for this program until 2028, we believe that about 7 billion US dollars will be uh, offered, will be pushed uh, more activities industry. The impact on price is very reduced because we are talking about uh, 50 billion liters of, uh, 40 billion liters of gasoline. So uh, which, this represents a very little, little impact to the customers. Next one, please. So uh, coming to the end, uh, I would like to, uh, to stress that biofuels is a modern and sound solution to decarbonize the transport and then that can be adopted right now. Uh, with the strong drivers, uh, the use of a national competitive and renewable product, an additive that improves gasoline quality and vehicle performance, improving air quality, generating employment and rural development. Uh, in fact, it is much more difficult to find good excuses for not implementing the use of biofuels as soon as possible. It's a kind of imperative that you should consider. I'm considering also the situation in some Latin American countries. To give you an example, Guatemala are producing and exporting high quality ethanol and they're using not just 1% blending in gasoline. So it's a very good solution for all countries that are, are in the tropical wet areas. Next slide, please. Here you have the comparison of the, this uh, efficiency that I mentioned you. you know, uh, the level of emission of these uh, different uh, fuels, hydrozethanol, anhydrozethanol, biodiesel, and even electricity, that even af uh, uh, after the launching of the flex fuel vehicles in Brazil, almost half billion tons of CO2 were not emitted due to the biofuels uh, used in, instead of gasoline. Next one, please. And we have some interesting opportunities for improving even more the biofuels, uh, innovative concepts such as the variable compression ratio, uh, new powertrain designs as the hybrid flex, flex fuel vehicles, and even disruptive technology, uh, such as the fuel cells. In Canada, you have the Ballard company that they are producing very, uh, very important in the global context in terms of producing these, uh, can be performed very well using biofuels. In fact, electric vehicles work better with biofuels. Where electric vehicles are vehicles that uh, are driven by electric motors, but electricity can be produced in the vehicle, in the, the concept of the hybrid vehicles, or in even more modern concept. Please, the next one, Roger. 
it's an interesting example. As you can see in the picture below, uh, here you have ethanol, 100% ethanol, that pass a reformer. In this reformer, we produce hydrogen. Hydrogen can be produced uh, in cheap conditions compared with electricity if you are using ethanol. And this ethanol and very high uh, grade ethanol goes to the solid oxide fuel cell where it produce power, goes to the battery or directly to the motor. It's a kind of e-biofuel. We can uh, run 30 kilometers, 30 kilometers with one liter of ethanol. There are other uh, uh, automotive companies that are proving this technology. So electric cars are coming, but they can use also ethanol. Next one, please. So uh, to close, I try to show you that biofuels can be very effective to reduce carbon emission, improve air quality in cities right now, using the logistic system that you have already in place, using the gas stations that you have, we don't need to deploy new equipment and new systems. Biofuel production use are ready to be adopted in many developing countries. I'm talking about many African countries and many South American and Latin American countries where there is land and weather and climate con conditions to, to produce that. This production has a large potential and its production brings relevant socioeconomic benefits also immediately. <laughs> okay, I think that is uh, what I would like to, next one, please, the, I, I'd like to address for you. Uh, I think that I have one slide more. Uh, it's about one, yes. This uh, book was prepared uh, by a large group of people many of them from Canada also. Uh, there is a very strong community on bioenergy in Canada. And uh, we prepared a very deep assessment of the sustainability aspect of bioenergy. And you are convinced that bioenergy can increase resilience on food, decrease pollution, preserve biodiversity, improve human health, and rehabilitate the graded land and mitigate climate change, as I show, and provide economic and business opportunity. Not all bioenergy can be considered good, but most of them can. We have instruments to evaluate that. And I believe that in a desirable future, we have a lot of bioenergy. Thank you uh, so much for your kind attention. And I am open for some uh, comments and additional uh, discussion. Thanks. Well, thanks to you, Professor Horta. Thanks indeed for, for the very interesting uh, presentation. I have uh, a few questions here after watching, right? Uh, but one thing that really got into, into attention, right, when you were talking about a new disruptive uh, technology, right? Uh, um, you know, the fuel cells are, are, everybody's talking about hydrogen, right? And but one of the challenges, Professor, is the pressure, right? For light vehicles, hydrogen must be held in very high pressure, right? We're talking 700 bars, right? This is a water column of seven kilometers high, right? Yes. Or the ones used to PSI, this is just over 10,000 PSI, right? So, this is the same pressure for fracking a, a formation, <laughs> right? To produce oil. It's a, it's a very significant amount of pressure. Yes. So a technology like the one you showed, right? For the e fuel cell vehicle can address those issues, right? Because you tank up with ethanol, right? There's no need for high pressure. So my question to you is how difficult it is to convert the, the infrastructure, let's say, for example, gasoline, right? How difficult it is to convert tanks and gas stations to dispense ethanol instead of gasoline? Thanks, Roger. Good, good question. And in fact, it's a hot topic currently. I believe that this trend towards hydrogen have been growth in the last five years, I guess. 
after recognizing that full electrification of mobility is not feasible. Uh, to implement systems, a grid, reinforcing the grid to put the, the systems to supply electricity, the concept of the Tesla model, full, just battery, it's unfortunately not feasible for the global transportation. As you know, it's interesting for small countries, Belgium, Netherlands, but if you consider China, Brazil, Canada, we have large distances. And the, the time for charging is, is a concern. And the power required, not the energy, the power, power required is, 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 in, is impressive. As uh, it is a very simple calculation that everyone can do. Uh, when you are filling up your tank with gasoline, for instance, uh, requiring four minutes, calculate the power, what is represented by this flow of energy, 40 liters of energy during 40 minutes represents almost 20 megawatts. So uh, <laughs> 20 megawatts is the capacity of the power station in Tajuba, our, our tower here. So we have a couple of gas stations. If you are installing just one uh, system, if you have, for instance, a super capacitor able to a fast charge, we need a very high capacity. So hydrogen is very interesting. I believe that there is a place for electricity in the concept of battery for hydrogen, but you mentioned a very important aspect, Roger, the safety and the cost and the complexity in technological terms to put fuels, not just 700, nowadays they are talking about 900 atmospheres. <laughs> it's it's a, a, a column of water of nine, nine, nine kilometers, is a lot of pressure. So the energy required, the equipment required, the material, I, I, I compare, uh, in, in the history of energy in our civilization, less process. You have he, in, in Canada, uh, Professor Vaclav Smil with nice books about that. So you know that we use electricity in the last century, just we start to use serious energy in the uh, 20th century, okay? We learn a lot about materials, about equipment, about the systems, about heads of uh, grids of transportation, distribution. The same will occur in the case of uh, hydrogen. We do need still to, to learn, to, to, to develop subsystems, to move in pipelines hydrogen. I'm not sure. Because there are problems of uh, uh, fragilization. There's a, a, a the, the, the very small molecule of H2 uh, inserts in the in the steel. So there's a lot of new problems, and we are going to to solve, but it's not simple. So it's wonderful to consider that we have some ways to transport hydrogen up to my tank in my car and produce hydrogen inside on board. There are two 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 very interesting products that can be used, ammonia and ethanol. Ammonia is NH3, ethanol is CH6O. Okay, ammonia is a gaseous, not a liquid, requires some pressure, not, not high pressure, but it's poisonous, has some problems. It's a fertilizer, <laughs> we, we know how to produce ammonia, there's no problem, but Ethanol is wonderful because it's very safe. And there is two ways to produce e e hydrogen from ethanol. In the gas station, you produce hydrogen in the moment that you are going to fill up your uh, high pressure in your car or fill up your tank with ethanol. And the uh, catalytic reform of CO uh, the ethanol is a relatively easy way to, to produce. Your question was about the conversion of the gas station equipment. There are many uh, fake news about that. There's the difficulty, there is the corrosion. It's, it's not true. 
Brazil in the 70s, during the uh, oil shocks, decided to distribute pure ethanol. And we introduced cars, now represents the flexible cars and the pure ethanol cars represent 8% of our fleet. So what's required to replace the tanks and the dispensers and the equipment? No. In Brazil in that time, we had two kinds of gasoline, as usual, abroad, the regular and the super one. In that time, we move all the Brazilian gasoline to the super octane number. Why and how? Adding ethanol. Ethanol is an octane buster. We put mid-level plants and the Brazilian gasoline is 92, what that time is a very high ethanol in that time. And in the tank and the pump used for regular was used for ethanol. The same equipment. Okay, there is, uh, it, it's not true that there is a, a problem. Of course, in some old cars, uh, <laughs> I have a Jeep Willys, uh, 1951. It's a nice car. I'm uh, using E27 without problem. Of course, I, I adjusted, I fitted the carburetor, but okay. Uh, if, if you have this real uh, situation, Consider that is not a serious problem that should be tackled and solved and, and is a good option for you. Well, excellent, Professor. Thanks so much. Uh, on this topic, uh, now that you mentioned the, the catalytic uh, reform of uh, ethanol to generate hydrogen, right? Uh, I was looking at the Nissan website, right? And I understand you still have CO2 Right, so at the exhaust pipe of yes. that car, you still have CO2 yes. coming out, right? So can you explain it to us? How come a vehicle yes. emitting CO2 is carbon neutral? Yes, because, a good question, no? Uh, we should uh, remember that we have essentially two kinds of CO2, the good one and the bad one. CO2 bed is, is the CO2 that is nowadays in the, under the soil, in the hydrocarbon fields in different ways, natural gas and uh, oil. When we pump this or take this and put again in a car, this carbon will be released to the atmosphere and recovering the atmosphere of our planet 200 million years ago when there was just a CO2 and other gas. So it's a, the kind of CO2 that you should avoid to emit. But there is the good CO2 that is the CO2 that is produced by the combustion of some photosynthetic produce. Is the case of uh, ethanol, biodiesel, biogas. Ethanol is a, a molecule with two carbons. This carbon is uh, a carbon originated from the atmosphere when the plant grows. And after burning, it goes back to the atmosphere. There is no net impact, no, not increase of the uh, carbon stock in the atmosphere. It's clear. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yes. So, yeah. Um, uh, we, we spoke a lot about uh, bioethanol and biodiesel, right? Uh, how about uh, jet fuel, Professor? We, we recently saw like yes. Airbus talking about hydrogen oh, airplanes, oh, oh. electric airplanes. Wouldn't it be more feasible <laughs> <That's> to, <laughs> to have a bio jet fuel? Is, it, is yes, that possible? Yes, yes. It is the next frontier that we are occupying. But it's interesting, you know, has the, unfortunately, a bad image of biofuels for many people. Uh, the people of airlines decided to use another title for this. It's SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuels. And the 
regulatory agency, the global regulatory agency for global aviation, civil aviation, is based in Montreal, in Canada, is ICAO. No, ICAO means International Civil Aviation Organization. And ICAO uh, is, is uh, conducting, is leading a very important program that are uh, organizing the substitution, the progressive substitution of um, jet fuel, common jet fuel, in the uh, global fleet of airplanes, the civil fleet of, of airplanes. And uh, it's, it's, it's a particular kind of biofuel because in the Brazilian context, for instance, we decided to put E27, we put a, in place a series of trials and evaluations and uh, tests in benches and decide it's a Brazilian fuel, no problem. During the World Soccer Cup, uh, crowds from uh, Chile and Argentina came to see the matches in Brazil with the cars from there. And any, have, and any noticeable problem they, they have, but it's a decision of the government Brazilian, uh, Brazilian fuel. The case of uh, aviation fuels, a plane can leave Ottawa and go to Sao Paulo or go to the, 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 down to Australia, Melbourne. So we should define a global specification and agree clearly about the safety conditions. There is no problem. And that was the role of uh, ICAO played very well. And now we have seven different kinds of aviation biofuels approved that as accepted by the Airbus, the Boeing, the Embraer, all the companies that they are uh, allowed to be used. And they have, uh, th there are some uh, airports already supplying this kind of blends of biofuels in the transport. So uh, it's a good aspect that we are uh, that to mention that after light vehicles, after trucks, now the aviation and even the maritime transport and oil tanks that are also in beginning to introduce uh, modern biofuels and performing quite well. Performing quite well. And there are different rules. Uh, nowadays, I would say that. Uh, one to two percent of the global consumption of jet fuel is already replaced by biofuels. Uh, there are some regular flights between Europe and Americas and some places that they are using in order to uh, promote, to diffuse this. And the main supplier of aviation biofuel <laughs> is in Finland, is Nest Oil Company, that I uh, using some hydrogenation of vegetable oil using a palm oil from Malaysia, from Indonesia. So it's for me something a little bit crazy to transport vegetable oil from uh, uh, these so far areas, goes to across the Indian Atlantic and go to the Baltic and reach Finland there, put some hydrogen. But now Paraguay is starting to produce this. And it's, it's interesting that uh, British Petroleum and uh, Shell had already made some uh, off-take contracts that will buy the HVO uh, specified even for aviation fuel from Paraguay because they have soybean oil and they have electric electricity, surplus of electricity to produce green hydrogen to hydrogen in that. We, we are crossing a fascinating uh, scenario, no? Open different opportunities than different things. Yeah. Yes. It's time, huh, Miguel. Uh, do we have time for one last question? Uh, there's one from Julio Oliveira. I don't know. Yeah, let, let's close. We have just two minutes, but let's close with this question from Julio. Okay. So Julio asks, uh, he's asking, can you expand a bit more on how sugar cranes crops are not a threat to food crops, both humans and cattle, using this to higher levels worldwide 
would likely require larger and larger areas to be used, which would either push away existing crops or areas that currently contain trees that recycle carbon anyway. What would a balanced approach look like in terms of current energy needs for transportation? Uh, good. Thank you, Julio. Thank you. Uh, I believe that the, I started discussing this aspect of food and bioenergy because I know that there are some uh, legitimate concerns about that. I, I present in the last slide is about a reference, the best reference I know about this kind of information, about sustainability, the true sustainability of biofuels. Uh, I, I'd like to just to comment that for me, this kind of uh, discussion uh, or proposal, I will produce biofuel, but not just from food crops. It's the European directive is clearly uh, restricting the biofuels production. Not, please. My, my concern is not affect the production of food, perfect, but if I take an, an area that are, was planted with food to put some no food crop to produce biofuel is worst. The name of the game is efficiency. Sugar cane and even corn and other uh, palm are very productive varieties or plants. To give you an idea, we can produce in average, in large average, 80,000 liters of ethanol per hectare. It's three times more than we are produced from corn. It's even much more than we are produced from other different uh, feedstocks in Europe. So we should look for a production chain that use lower amount of land, low amount of water, water is a very important in, uh, input, low amount of in, uh, uh, chemicals in order to produce with a, a less energy, external energy and resources that you can, that, that you can use. So sugar cane is, a, I repeat that, is a very important uh, option as an option of choice if you are considering if you are looking for small areas. Uh, I have a paper about that uh, exactly. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I should mention that years ago, um, a, a Nobel Prize, a German Nobel Prize, uh, wrote a paper. Uh, taught the, the name of the paper is editorial in a very traditional journal of chemical engineering in German. He wrote the irrationality of bioenergy. And I, I don't accept that because in some regions in German could be, but not in, in other areas where there is a plenty of sun, there is land available. In Africa, they are using just few percent of the area for some economic reasons. They do need employment, they do need generating income and Bioenergy could play a role of that. And I made some calculation about the area required if you consider a no food crop or sugar cane, which is efficiency. So Julio, I'll be glad to talk more with you in other opportunity and present my, my data, my perception of that. I will send to uh, my colleague Roger some, some papers, some, some notes about that, not to convince you, but, but to, to have some feedback from you if, you, if it is clear or not. Thank you. Uh, I think that our time is over. So uh, I'd like to, to make, make my, my first comment. That I'm very happy to be with you uh, today. And uh, you are doing a nice job proposing the discussion of these uh, good themes. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Roger. Thank you very much, uh, Luis Augusto. Uh, this is a very, very fascinating conversation, and I'm sure that there is there is some some meat for discussion here. A, a very interesting topic. Uh, what I can just probably summarize in very brief is that we need to find the right balance between, as you mentioned, food and fuel instead of 
food versus fuel. And I think there is a great opportunity to, to be more efficient, right? In this, trans, in this uh, transition to new forms of energy. Uh, by the way, CCA is uh, organizing the Breakfast of the Americas in September. September 21st is going to be, just save the date. And, and the topic is going to be energy transition. And we are going to be discussing different, different sources of energy. And with that, I'd like to thank our, uh, you, Luis Augusto, for taking the time to, to share with us your knowledge. And, and thank you very much. Uh, and also to Roger, Roger, that make a great moderation today. Thank you, Roger, for, for suggested this topic and, and for your passion about and the moderation this mm -hmm. morning. And with that, I just want to remind you that we have our last uh, weekly chat of this uh, before the, we enter into the summertime. Next week, next Tuesday, we are having a conversation on digital transformation in Latin America. And hopefully you can join us same time. Uh, it's Tuesday, June 29th, uh, 10 a.m. Mount, Mountain Standard Time. And we are planning also an in-person event in the summer. We are going to let you know, probably after the Stampede week, uh, just, to, just to meet in person and have some social, social activity. Have a great day, everybody, and hope to see you soon. Gracias. Muy obrigado. <laughs> Muito obrigado. Uh, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, bye. Okay.